NICAM was really exciting because we, we were determined to get three stereo programs onto one telecom bearer at two megabits. So we had to think of ways of compressing the audio from the necessary 13 or 14 bits, which is about what gives you the same as FM quality. But we had to get it down to 10 bits. Um, there was a good deal of skullduggery, a lot of work at the research department on how to do this and how to do the subjective testing. But it fell to me to run the project to design the first properly engineered operational equipment. And we had all this stuff in sort of pre-production format. And the idea was they were going to use it as a contribution circuit from Manchester and Birmingham into London. And about that time, um, political uh, uh, relationships with China had thawed out a lot and uh, a cultural tour involved the BBC Symphony Orchestra going to China and visiting various cities and they decided that the big thing was to broadcast this concert from Shanghai in Europe. Now at that time the preferred way was to bag up a load of telephone circuits and use a kind of frequency splitting technique to bring it all out and put it together again. Unfortunately, at that time, the number of telephone circuits out of China was so small and the number of parallel circuits just wasn't available. So they said, I tell you what, we'll use this NICAM kit. So the decoders were already bolted to the racks in London in Broadcasting House. And they took a coder from Birmingham and a whole raft of spare cards and flew these out to Shanghai. And they put them over a video bearer because there was no telecom digital stuff. And this thing, which had a telecom code, the so-called HDB3, they put that over a video bearer to Peking, and then on a satellite link, and then it was brought down at Goonhilly and sent over at video circuits again. And uh, it was great. There had been one previous transmission using NICAM, using prototype equipment, which was an Elton John concert from Moscow. But uh, this thing from Shanghai was the big thing. And uh, from then on, NICAM was great you know and we spent the next couple of years doing things like sample rate converters because it was 32 kilohertz and just at this time AES3 was coming in and they'd perhaps do a concert at the Albert Hall and they wanted to record it digitally and it would all have AES3 connections and this is where we burnt our fingers and got it all wrong over the cable impedances for AES3 and all this stuff and people tried Starcord and it didn't work and it was just after that, of course, the first AES3 spec was published. But we had to make a sample rate converter with no chips. But the best thing we had was a multiplier, a Mac coat, a Mac chip, you know, which got red hot. You know, we did these digital filters to uh, do the sample rate conversion from 48 to 32, and then it went straight into NICAM. But it was actually too difficult to get it out to the transmitters without coming back to analog somewhere. There were so many things, gain adjustment, mixing in announcements and all stuff that it's a shame, but we couldn't go digital all the way for a long time after that. One of the biggest London companies, Thames Television, was going to rebuild their whole uh, master control, as you'd say, what they called presentation. But they wanted to do it stereo. And they realised, of course, that if you go stereo in analogue, you've got twice as many circuits, You've got several more ways you can get it wrong. The operators are tied up much more in checking left-right gain and phase and all the rest of it. And the AS3 interface was the answer to the maiden's prayer for them. But there was no equipment. And at ProBell, we set out to design that. <coughs> and we had to design a, a switching matrix, which actually was a time division multiplex bus. And it was possibly the first one in the audio industry Back in those days, the commercial people had a legal requirement concerning signal quality and signal to noise ratio. The BBC had their own specification for the specification, for example, for an analog audio router. And the noise level, the absolute noise level, had to be minus 80 dB weighted. We realised very quickly that 16 bits isn't good enough, nothing like. And besides, where could you get a 16 bit converter? They said 16 bits, but they actually measured 14. So we had to think of something and we developed a, a sliding technique for the loudest audio. This thing sat at the top of the range and coded 14 bits. If it fell silent for a few tens of milliseconds, 
um, which was just a very simple monostable that hung onto it. And then when the audio was below that level, it let it drop down 6 dB, 12 dB. And the thing was coding and just extending the sign bit. And of course, if something loud happened, it had to gear up very, very quickly. The perceptual effect of this was very small because although it, was, it amounted to total harmonic distortion, it was only one instance of it on one edge. So uh, this technique um, really paid dividends. In fact, it sounded so good compared with people doing their utmost to give the best possible no signal to noise from a single part that uh, some of the most hi-fi names in the business, and I, I hesitate to quote, I suppose, but Q-Sound were always pretty fussy about it, and they actually preferred the gain-ranging one to the first oversampling ones. For the record, the, the, the existence of standards made it much easier for ProBell to sell these ideas to Thames Television and to the BBC when they knew there was a standard for digital interconnections and they knew that Sony kit would plug into ProBell kit and everything else meant they had the confidence to go into digital audio and it really was important and it still is because instead of having to see as in those early days you'd have a lot of problems if you connected a brand X signal to a brand Y recorder and when you played back the brand Y recorder into brand Z DAC sometimes it didn't work and nobody could work out why. If you went through a ProBell routing switcher it normalized all this and if the thing would talk to the router you knew it would talk to all the sources and all the destinations because it had made a new AES stream that was exactly according to the standards book and this gave people huge confidence in converting to digits with this um, normalizing router as its core and that was quite an important development. <laughs>